So we will resume in public session. We're now in public session and at the outset I would like to remind members and witnesses uh, in relation to mobile phones if you could uh, turn them off fully or to flight mode. They both interfere with the committee, the recording and the broadcast. I also wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to the committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statements that you've submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting. And members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him her, or her identifiable. So I'd like to welcome at this stage the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government, uh, represented this afternoon by Barbara Nicka-Ingusa, Sarah Neary, Philip Nugent and Colin Ryan, and the City and Management Association, represented by Mr Eugene Cummins, Billy Coleman, Owen Keegan, Catherine Keenan, Margaret Geraghty and Dick Brady. And hopefully I've missed nobody there. Uh, your full submissions uh, have been received and have been submitted to members. Um, and just to colleagues, this is the uh, final session uh, of public hearings in relation to our deliberations. Uh, some of you have been here before, and the context you're here is issues, I suppose, the fact that you, in your role, many of the provision and the frontline services are coming directly through yourselves, and it's in that capacity that issues that have arisen over the previous weeks, uh, members have follow-up questions. At this stage, uh, as I say, the submissions have been received and circulated to members. Uh, so I'll ask uh, Barbara Nick Angusa in it to summarise the department's sub, uh, submission and then Mr Commons with the association. And we'll take questions from colleagues at that stage. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank the Chairman and members of the committee for inviting the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government here today to discuss issues in relation to housing and homelessness and to answer any questions you may have about the Department's functions, operational plans or administrative procedures. Uh, as my name is Barbara Nick Engelsa and I am the Assistant Secretary with responsibility for social housing policy and I'm accompanied here this afternoon by Sarah Neary, Principal Advisor in Architecture and Building Standards Unit, Philip Nugent, Principal Officer Rental and AHB Regulation Unit, and Colin Ryan, Senior Advisor in Planning. You will have heard from the Minister this morning about the Government's intention in line with the commitments in the Programme for Partnership Government to develop and publish an action plan for housing within its first 100 days in office. The level of ambition set for the Government's plan is high and rightly so, as we're now facing an acute crisis in housing in many parts of the country. In recent weeks, the Taoiseach announced the establishment of the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government, and the Department has been reorganised to focus intensively on the challenge of tackling the housing crisis. We have recruited additional specialist and administrative staff to cater for the increased activity and we have assigned additional resources at senior management level specifically to housing. Over the past few months, the Department has engaged in an intensive process of information sharing and consultation with local authority staff and approved housing body staff across the country to jointly develop our skills and capacities so that we can work together more effectively to expedite the social housing programmes. We have also assigned resources to a special cross-divisional team on housing, combining specialist and administrative skills to consider the current challenges from the perspective of planning, land management and private housing market, and to identify potential measures to stimulate increased activity in the housing sector generally. Rather than cover the same ground as the Minister did this morning, I think it might be helpful to the Committee if I were to provide you with information on some of the Department's administrative procedures and policies which have been the subject of debate and comment in recent weeks. A recurring theme in the Committee's discussions about social housing has been the question of the time involved in the Department's approval process. 
I would like to take the opportunity this afternoon to clarify, firstly, what these approval processes are, and secondly, to outline the measures we are taking to improve them, to enable social housing construction projects to be accelerated in as much as we possibly can, consistent with our obligations under the Public Spending Code. Like all government capital expenditure, social housing projects funded by the Department must comply with the Government's Capital Works Management Framework, or CWMF. The strategic objectives of which are to ensure greater cost certainty, better value for money and financial accountability at all stages during project delivery. Working within the scope and objectives of this framework, and with a view to supporting the earliest possible delivery of targets under the social housing strategy, the Department has streamlined the nine approval stages of the CWMF to only four approval stages for capital funded social housing construction projects in consultation and agreement with the City and County Management Association, CCMA, who are also here today. This process facilitates local authorities to forward design proposals and costings to the Department sequentially as they are advanced through the authorities' planning work. A summary of the four stages of the Department's approval process is as follows. Stage one is capital appraisal to establish the business case and the suitability of the proposed location. Stage two is pre-planning outline design and cost check. Stage three is a pre-tender cost check and stage four is tender approval. These stages are considered the minimum required for complex construction projects in order to allow the department's accounting officer to make the annual declaration as to the proper management of public funds to meet the requirements of the controller and auditor general and to allow an efficient and proactive check on the achievement of quality housing, sustainable communities proofing and prudent cost control as each project progresses. At the request of the CCMA, the Department also introduced a new procedure in January 2016 to facilitate a further streamlined mechanism of funding approvals on a pilot basis for social housing construction projects of up to 15 housing units with a maximum all-in budget of less than 2 million. This mechanism is most suited to one-off and small-scale housing developments where the cost can be reasonably accurately determined. Local authorities opting for this process provide a more in-depth capital appraisal proposal than is ordinarily provided to allow us issue an approved budget for the project. As the Minister has mentioned this morning and on a number of other occasions, we are currently reviewing our procedures in the Department to see whether the approval process can be further expedited in a manner consistent with the need to ensure quality and value for money in the delivery of social housing projects which are fully funded by the Exchequer. The Department has recently put arrangements in place to send specialist teams to visit local authorities and engage intensively with them about their plans and projects. Such meetings can increase mutual understanding and dramatically reduce the potential for prolonged correspondence about technical details, which in the past may have taken weeks or months. Since January, teams from the Department have visited and met with almost all of the local authorities, with dates already set for the next round of meetings to be held in June and July. Already we have received positive feedback from local authority staff and management about this approach and as a result we expect to see a much smoother passage of projects through the stages of the approval process in the coming months. Another theme which has been mentioned in the committee's discussions on social housing is the department's requirements regarding sustainable communities. The policy of sustainable communities is in part a response to the evidence from a considerable body of international research into the social isolation, lack of educational achievement and financial progress experienced by families isolated on large monotenure social housing estates. In Ireland, remediation of such housing schemes has necessitated substantial investment of exchequer funding in Dublin, Limerick, Cork and other urban centres. This work is still ongoing 
and regeneration projects will continue to be a feature of our social housing programmes for some years to come. In order to avoid repetition of this phenomenon, which some commentators have referred to as the ghettoisation of vulnerable families, Consistency with the mixed tenure neighbourhoods promoted by sustainable communities requires us to limit the size of any social housing development to a number appropriate to the size of the town or city, as well as ensuring that it is well connected to and integrated with the wider community. The department's guidelines are framed to provide prudent guidance, though they do allow for some element of flexibility. A number of local authority development plans have also incorporated the concept that proper planning and sustainable development of a town requires promoting mixed tenure communities and thus would not support any further large mono-tenure developments. In short, the idea behind sustainable communities is to create neighbourhoods in which people want to live and which address the three pillars of sustainability, environmental, social and financial. In Ireland, this concept was incorporated as a fundamental element of housing policy in the 2007 policy document, Delivering Homes, Sustaining Communities, and it was reaffirmed in the 2011 housing policy statement. The Social Housing Strategy 2020 states that the delivery of social housing under the strategy will be carried out in a way which is consistent with this key principle of developing sustainable communities. The Department's guidance on sustainable communities finds its corollary in other measures, such as the Part 5 requirement under the Planning Act, which is also designed to promote socially integrated communities. In conclusion, I'm sure that the members of this committee are very familiar at this stage with the objectives of the social housing strategy. That is, to provide 35,000 additional social housing units by 2020, with another 75,000 social housing clients provided for through the private rented sector. The three pillars of the strategy, the provision of additional units, the expansion of provision through the private rented sector and a progressive pro programme of social housing reform are also well known. At the heart of all of this is the strategy's vision, which is set out on its very first page. That every household in Ireland will have access to secure, good quality housing, suited to their needs at an affordable price in a sustainable community. We in the department are absolutely committed to playing our part in bringing this vision to fruition. Together with my team, I look forward to discussing this and other matters further with the committee this afternoon. And of course, we are happy to answer any questions that members may have. Gormila Mahagaf. Thank you very much for your opening statement. And before we go to questions, we will have um, Mr Eugene Cummins and his opening statement on behalf of the CCMA. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Chairman and uh, committee members, uh, we are very pleased to be back here this afternoon to further assist the committee in its examination of the issues and challenges facing all of us in relation to housing and homelessness. Uh, as Chairman, as you have said, my name is Eugene Cummins and I am the Chairman of the CCMA Housing Committee. And I am accompanied by my colleagues Owen Keegan, the Chief Executive of Dublin City Council, uh, Dick Brady, the Assistant Chief Executive of Dublin City Council, Billy Coleman, Director of Services, South Dublin County Council, Catherine Keenan, Director of Services, Dunleary Ratdown County Council, and Margaret Garrity, Director of Services, Fingal County Council. As previously stated, Chairman, on the 26th of April, local authorities are fully committed to social housing provision, social housing accommodation, and to addressing homelessness. The points we made at that time uh, still stand. Uh, the local authorities will continue to work with a range of stakeholders, including the housing agency, approved housing bodies and the private sector, government departments and all communities to deliver sustainable housing. And in addition to the points made on the 26th of April, I take this opportunity, Chairman, to highlight some of the key issues that need to be addressed, namely um, the private sector engagement. Um, Chairman, the immediate concern for local authorities is the absence of the private sector in significant numbers from housing construction. As we all know, the key issue facing housing in Ireland is supply of housing stock, and quite simply, supply does not equal demand. This is leading to difficulties for families and individuals 
who wish to either buy or rent their homes. If more people could access housing that is affordable, which is the preference of the majority of people, people, then the pressure on social housing will ease. As previously stated, unless the private sector returns to building properties in significant numbers, the problem, including homelessness, is going to get worse. In relation to sustainable communities, it is acknowledged, Chairman, that local authorities and the state own a sizeable land bank, but social housing can only be built, for the most part, on a small percentage of these sites. We have learned from past mistakes that building large social housing estates is not the way forward. Building sustainable communities is the way forward, where mixed tenures and properly planned communities with all of the support, services and facilities such as schools, parks, amenities, community facilities, transport services and commercial facilities such as retail, leisure facilities and cultural services are available. This term is wholly consistent with the policy delivering homes sustainable communities and local authorities work with our partners in the government departments and state agencies to deliver on these objectives. Importantly, and as, already, and as already highlighted, we work in partnership with the private sector to deliver a suitable mix of housing tenure and a range of services in mixed use schemes. Our focus on sustainable development will not delay the delivery of our targets, but reiterates the need for a partnership with the private sector to achieve sustainable developments for future gener generations. In relation to delivering targets, Chairman, local authorities met their targets as per government policy set out in the Social Housing Strategy 2020 uh, for, to, for 2015. For, for 2015. And, and we are certainly up to meeting the challenge in coming years. But this requires the active participation and engagement of the private sector. I would also like to highlight that the rates of vacant units are now as low as 1 to 2 per cent in many cases. In addition to the voids, the housing strategy being in advance includes a mix of construction and housing support through HAP. And while working within uh, current frameworks, planning and budgetary, we are committed to doing everything we can to achieve the targets set out for us by government. In relation to the statutory framework, local authorities, like our partners in the various government departments, are obliged to strictly adhere to procurement rules and the legislative provisions of planning law. In general, there is no magic formula for significant time savings. However, we will continue to work with government departments to explore any area or process that, makes, that, that may have the potential to save time in contract delivery. In relation to risk appetite, as previously stated, we must and will deliver our social housing objectives in partnership with a range of government departments, state agencies and the private sector. All projects, including housing initiatives, are not without their risks, and anyone involved in a capital project, from a small extension to a home to a major urban renewal scheme, knows that despite all efforts to manage or mitigate risks, cost certainty can only be achieved at final account stage. Consequently, Chairman, financial risk overruns uh, must be shared by all stakeholders. And to conclude, Chairman, uh, we have and will continue to work with the various departments, approved housing bodies and the housing agency to deliver homes for those on our housing lists in sustainable communities and within the legislative framework of planning and procurement policies. Delivery of a mixture of private and public mixed tenure will undoubtedly need an increase in private sector construction. Housing is a priority for local government. We are committed to achieving our housing targets and the local government sector will continue to be available to this committee to assist with your deliberations. Thank you very much, Chairman. Th thank you very much for your opening statement. Uh, as I say, uh, some of you have been here before, and as this is our final meeting, uh, issues that have arisen over uh, a number of weeks uh, during our deliberations and consultations with others uh, has prompted further questions, questions around areas of local authorities and uh, maybe land banks, the planning process, the delivery between the department and the various local authorities. And while you've addressed some of those in the opening statements, I'm sure a number of colleagues will want to probe those in a bit more detail. To the colleagues who are, have questions, I just want to say that in addition to the CCMA, uh, as we're 
here before, we have this time representatives from each of the four Dublin local authorities if there were any particular questions that wanted to be addressed to those. A number of people have indicated at this stage, I'll take a couple together and that'll, if they're general, let them be general, or if you want to direct them to somebody specific, please identify who they are. Deputy O'Dowd, please. Yes. Point of procedure. Um, we've had Mr Cummins in before, but I do, I do think people would like to hear what are the plans, maybe, of each of the local But you'll get an opportunity to address those to or the I local... I just thought that yeah. they might, for a few minutes each, be able to tell us, because otherwise... Well... I, 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 at this stage, I'm going to take the questions, and if that's what you, what you want to ask them, uh, Deputy O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Just, uh, I think part of the problem has been a lack of a local authority build uh, over over maybe a nine, ten year period when housing ceased to be. I, I live in Drogheda. I was a member of Drogheda Borough Council for more years than I care to remember. But uh, we were always building houses, and then we moved away from department-sanctioned uh, funding by the local authority to housing associations. The advantage was, I suppose, that from a local authority perspective, very narrow, it being that they didn't have to do the maintenance. In many cases, they didn't even have to select the tenants once they came off the housing list in whatever order uh, the housing association wished to take them. And I think that's when we lost the, the capacity uh, to, to deal properly with the problem uh, because we were not, the local authority no longer had the skills or was no longer involved in it. So, so my question is, um, given the, the social housing plan 2014 and given the different percentages in some counties, some is going to build 50% of their need, others it will be 25% and so on, there's no equity within that plan based on the applicants per local authority area. In other words, the percentages, if you can build 50% of the need in, in Longford, you know, you might only have to build 100 houses, whereas in Dublin it could be in the thousands. So do you need to look again at that programme to have, you know, that you build X percentage, say 50% of, of all houses needed will be built in a certain time frame and drill down from that? Because you're going to, you're going to have huge areas, I believe, that probably won't be built on at all. You know, because because you won't have the capacity to deliver. Um, the second question is, um, it goes it, it it goes back to you know affordable housing in the mix. I respect what Mr. Cummins said, but and I'm not splitting hairs or taking personal issue with him. But when you said that, given all the land that there is in local authority or state ownership, that you couldn't see the local authorities building only if I've got it right, only a, sm a small portion of the land. I think there's words you used. Uh, that would concern me greatly, because who builds on the rest of the land? And if we I appreciate you made the point of reference to, you know, that they, 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 uh, actually that you would have an integrated housing that wouldn't be just social housing, but you know, I just think we need to move away from that, and that we need to build proper uh, social and affordable housing together. That's that people can afford to buy or they can afford to live in, and I think if it's built to the highest possible standard, uh, and it should be, I don't see why you couldn't build a very, a very, I would say. I don't, I'm, I don't have a rule book in my hand, but I would say you should, a very significant portion of state land must be built in, must be built in, because it's far cheaper for the state to do that, to use its own land, because the cost of land is already there than it is to go to the private sector. And the final question I have, um, why did the four Dublin local authorities refuse all those houses which were offered to them by NAMA? You, as I understand it, there is uh, 6,000 6, in the whole state, and the figures for Dublin we can give you if, if you don't necessarily have them with you. But it seems to me that if you were offered a, the, a number of, the, the, sorry, the number of houses you were offered equal the number of people who were homeless in the city, so they would in theory all have been housed. And the other point is that the houses that you refused to accept, they then went back to the private landlord. And as Deputy Butler said before, the people that are living in those houses are local authority applicants on HAP and rent allowance. So the whole thing just doesn't make sense. And I think the local authorities uh, erred significantly in refusing those houses. And I'd like to know why you didn't accept them. Thank you, Deputy. I'll also take Deputy O'Brien at this stage. Thanks, uh, Chair, and, and thank you for the uh, presentations. Just a couple of comments in response, and then I suppose two key questions. From the outside, 
and I appreciate that people like me know far less about how the procurement and tendering process works than, than the people in front of us. But from the outside, what I see is very competent officials in local authorities, very competent officials in the Department of Now Housing. And yet they have to continue to go back and forth through that still very, very long four-stage approval process to take decisions, which I suppose the question in my mind is, why can't that decision-making process be located in one of those competent sets of bodies rather than both? It just, it, 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 it can't be the case that you cannot have a approval and procurement process that is substantially shorter than the existing four-stage process. Uh, that still allows you to meet all of the requirements in terms of quality build and quality approval of taxpayers' money. I just I can't understand how that's not possible. And it seems to me one of the problems is the fact that you have two different bodies, two different arms of the state, having to go back and forth and back and forth is, is the key piece of the problem. I know the Minister is looking at it, but it just the more I hear the Minister talk about shortening the Part 8 process uh, as his first kind of... Uh, uh, pronouncement, the more I wonder why we can't actually just focus really on prioritising the shortening of that approval and procurement. And I just, I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm urging uh, action in relation to that. The second thing, and I suppose for me this is the, the much more frustrating thing, I, I have yet to see, and I use the exact phrase Barbara that used, consider a body of international research on monotenure estates. I don't believe there is a considerable body of international research. Uh, that's very clearly government policy for quite some period of time. But in fact, we have research from some of the most respected housing academics from our own state, uh, Tony Fahey and Michelle Norris's uh, seven state study from 10 years ago and then their follow up, which shows that actually there are very strong merits uh, to monotenure estates, as well as issues, uh, but those issues less to do with the tenure mix and more to do with investment in social economic infrastructure. The real difficulty, however, is this. If on the one hand we're saying we have a huge housing need, and particularly for those people for whom the market is never going to provide housing, those people for whom social housing is the option, but we're saying we cannot have large-scale social housing build because of the constraints uh, of the sustainable communities approach, then here's what we're going to have. We're going to have large amounts of small infill projects. The majority of the new builds under the current strategy are small infill projects in areas that already have high concentrations of social housing and therefore are in of themselves in breach of the sustainable communities ethos. Or we're going to have uh, uh, small amounts, smaller now because of the new regulations, of part five uh, units in private housing estates. And again, there's no research since we introduced this model that putting 10% or 15% of lower income families in larger private estates creates any level of integration. In fact, a lot of those estates, many of us would argue there's far less integration uh, because of the way they're designed. So I just, I, 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 I can't see how with the constraints of, of sustainable communities and low level investment in public housing, we're going to tackle the problem. Um, and I have to say, Eugene, the very focus that you placed on the private sector, in my view, is part of the problem. The whole reason why we call it the social housing sector is because the market cannot meet the needs of those people. So for us to think that the market is going to be key to reducing that acute level of housing need, I just think is symptomatic of the problem. So cheers. here's my questions. 